if you weren't very sure about who you are, right, what person you are, or who you should be in a particular context, then how would you figure out what to do? What attitudes should you express? How are they going to treat me? How should I dress? What are my expectations? So having a sense of who you are in a particular context, so that immediately prescribes to me how I should behave. So it's not very adaptive if you wander through life constantly unsure of who you are or how you fit in. Uncertainty identity theory, it's a theory about what motivates people to join groups, to identify with social categories. These can be small groups, uh, work groups and so forth. Social categories can be like a national group, a political group, an ethnic group. You're really a big group. And the theory simply states that people, that being a member of these kinds of groups, belonging to these groups, being identified with it, being recognized as a member, reduces a feeling of uncertainty about who you are in the world. And by reducing a sense of uncertainty about who you are in the world, then you can kind of figure out how you should behave. You can predict how other people will treat you because they know who they are, they have expectations, how you should interact with people who are like you, how you should interact with people who are not like you. So it's very good for society, it's very good for people because it allows people to belong. If you don't belong to a particular group, then those group goals that allow human beings to achieve the things they do, like sending people to space, um, uh, cleaning up the environment, they wouldn't exist. Right? So it's very, very, very important and central to who we are to belong to these kinds of groups. Um, it's bad for people in society if this is all you do. You organize your whole life um, around identifying and belonging to a particular group. No other groups, that one group. What normally happens on a day-to-day -day basis is if you identify with a group, a social category, your nation, your organization, you kind of feel loyalty towards it and you feel all things being equal it's a bit better than other places. I don't think that's a problem. That becomes a problem when you actually hate the other group. For some reason or other it's not just that you are better than them but you really despise them. They're a real threat to you. You really hate them. So then you get the xenophobia and the extremist kinds of behavior. So when it gets to that level then it becomes really serious. I mean typically what tends to happen is these very strong xenophobic relations between groups, these very extreme kinds of views tend to be organized around ethnic national lines, religious lines, and political lines. And we have this now. It's not just in the United States. Um, it's, um, it's in lots and lots of countries. And I think it's very easy for us to sometimes think this is a unique issue right now. I don't think it is. I think we've always had it. My research background is in what's called social identity theory. It's to do with the relationship between who you are and the groups you are in and you identify with. So it's called the social identity lab because we look at the relationship between you know, you, how you define yourself and the various groups and categories you belong to. But actually we look at pretty much anything to do with interaction within groups, influence processes within groups, and how groups interact with other groups, small groups, large groups, and so forth. I'm really interested in this uncertainty and group processes kind of question. So we do a fair bit on extremism in various forms. The other thing I'm fascinated in is where do you get your extremist ideologies from or just your basic group thing? Typically it's leaders, all right? They can be formal leaders or informal leaders. And so we study leadership and how leaders can create groups, frame what they're like and influence people within the group. So we do research on leadership. And I guess the other third thing we've been looking at quite a lot is how groups fall apart. All right, so you look at the EU. All right, so Britain just left. You know, a bunch of other places might want to leave. So why is it and how do groups fall apart? What causes that? All the research, all of it is done in collaboration with my students and then with links through to other countries. The social psychology program here is very much on the map globally, not just within the US but across, across the world. So we bring people in from all around the world. So I have strong connections in um, the University of Kent in England and in England generally speaking. Um, we do research on the dark triad of leadership with colleagues in Germany and France. We do a lot of research in Italy through colleagues at um, Sapienza University in Rome and these many other countries. These are all very concrete, very real collaborative relationships um, that attract research funding, um, usually from overseas um, sources, there's more money, and put lots and lots of publications. So it's very good for my students. It keeps them globally connected if they want to be in nice places like Italy. <laughs>